Strategy. Design. Marketing. UX. Digital. Development. This is Agencies That Build. This show is dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Jesse, and I'm a marketer and an agency owner. And I'm Varun. I'm not a marketer, but a coder and an agency partner. This show is sponsored by Together We Ship. On a mission to help agencies grow. All right, rock on. Here we are again, my friend, Varun. What's going on? No more vacation photo in the background. You've moved on from the beach. I've moved on from the beach. I'm moving on to another, I think, uh, step in my career, in my life. Um, in, we had last year, yesterday, we were, like me and my wife, we were heads down into our research into first real estate investment property, which oh. is not a good idea. I think I'm not ready for that, but it was like, I don't know, just half of my day just going into that thinking and talking about it so god knows where will we where will that journey take us but um i'm looking forward to try that i'm looking forward to hearing about it which is actually a good opener for what's to come in our conversation i don't know if you plan that at all but <laughs> so let me introduce uh two gentlemen here, fellas, uh, we have another twofer this week, which is so fun, two co-founders, um, from Elva. Elva is a full-service design group driven to create beautiful and effective branded e-commerce experiences or commerce experience. So these gentlemen also, as a fun fact, as we introduce them, um, are both former senior level soccer stars, which means they are passionate about winning. I see um, one of you is shaking your head. We can talk about that in a minute. But <laughs> co-founder and technology director, J.P. McCarville, and co-founder and executive creative director, Michael Francis, welcome to the podcast. So Thank you so much. For having us. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> and uh, both of your backgrounds are beach related because you are West Coast based. So unlike Varun and I on the East Coast, so it's we've got it all covered. All right. First question, our our myth busting question. What uh misconception, bogus strategy, what myth do you want to clear up? What what do you guys got for us today? I think you know the biggest thing is you know starting a creative agency, especially before COVID when remote work wasn't the norm, is um, you know, the, the thought was you gotta be in the same room. And you've got to have this like cool office and like everybody comes in and points over each other, kind of over, over each other's shoulders and like points at the screen and collaborates. And that's the only way to collaborate, like very mad men. And, um, you know, when Michael and I, uh, when Michael and I came up with the idea of Elva five, five, six years ago, Michael, you know, really came forward and said, you know, we could, we could have a physical office, but I think we need the best people from all over North America, all over the world. And that required us to be remote and forced us to collaborate remotely. The tools have gotten better, you know, Figma for, for design, Zoom, um, et cetera. All of it has gotten better. But, um, you know, the myth, what, the myth to bust there was that a creative agency has to be in the same, to be in the same room to create the best work, you know, in the industry. We felt like, it was more important to get the best people and um and collaborate remotely and it's it's really come through in the group we have incredible group of people and we wouldn't have we wouldn't be able to work with people all across north america all across the world if we had said oh we're just going to be in seattle or we're just going to be in new york um that remote culture was was critical it was funny that you said um even before covid you have been remote and especially the creative agency being remote mm -hmm. is um, interesting. And you're talking about the time when you were before Figma. I mean, Figma has True. definitely changed right. the remote working, but I'm curious. I mean, I would love to learn more, like what did you guys do? What How worked? did you do it? You know, what, what didn't work? Yeah, give it the nuggets, a lot the of, golden nuggets of a success. A lot of Google meetings, a lot of Google meets and Zooms, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, Trying to find trying to find creative talent in one geographical location, let alone put on top of that e-commerce design talent, is incredibly difficult to find that experience. And so, we really didn't have a choice but to open up to 
North America. You know, a lot, communication is key. A lot of meetings throughout the day. So, you know, un unfortunately, there wasn't Figma back in those days. <laughs> Quickly came, but we made it work. We, we had Slack, we had Google Meetings, we had texting, <laughs> emails. I mean, there was there was constant communication throughout the Everything. day. Everything. Why, why did you decide to do the remote? Like, why did you want to have the setup of the company that way? I mean, what, what originally, Mike, you? you know, originally Michael and I were in different places. I mean, Michael at the time was in uh, was in Washington State. I was in I was in Austin, Texas, at Yeti, and um, you know, starting a business remotely at, with a business partner is a huge challenge itself. But we never felt like that was something that would be definitive of our success. You know, to say we're going to be successful, we're only going to be successful if if we're together. Um, we felt like being remote actually was a, a more of an advantage. How, how did you guys get started? Because I know we talked a little bit in our conversation and you have an interesting, you know, how did you, I was going to make some sort of terrible joke about how did you m lean into winning um, and going back to the stalker reference, but I'll, I'll give it up for now. So, you know, how, tell us a little bit about your origin story, how you guys got to, and then we can kind of go back to your process and how you make that work. Absolutely. So in my previous life, I was a group creative director at an agency in Seattle and JP was working for Yeti at the time. JP and, and the team over there at Yeti were doing a replatform redesign for Yeti.com and they hired our agency to do it. Uh, we quickly, you know, JP and I started working together, quickly learned that we, uh, really enjoyed working together. We had the same methodology, the same approach and the same uh, thought process around how partners and, and agencies and companies should work together. And so here we are. I think something that you said yesterday or in our, our prep call was yesterday, for those of you listening, here's the full transparency. Um, you said something about you wanted to build out an agency. You, you I, I said you, you wanted to build a partner that you wanted. There was, there was, you said it better yesterday, but that was an interesting, what were you finding with folks that you're working with or how do you guys work as that partner that you were hoping to have? You know, what are a couple of things that make you different from that perspective? Like what's. Let me back up a little bit. So when I was in Seattle, I would literally get up out of my seat and travel to Austin every week and every other week to sit down with the team, talking to product designers, talk to the e-commerce team, the e-commerce lead, learning their business, understanding their expectations, what they want out of this new experience. So basically I was essentially acting as an extension to their team. And I would sit down next to JP every day, asking questions about UX, UI, how that's gonna be, if it's feasible, for technology and the, and the development team. And so just making that process much more efficient and going to them to, to execute on the project. And so we've taken that methodology and brought it into our own agency. So when we work with partners, we like to act as an extension to their team and constantly communicate and be in conversation with them. Um, working with them on a daily or weekly basis. What tools are you using to to do that? Now I'm just hunting for name drops here. You know, it, while we've talked about Figma, are there ones out of the ordinary that you guys have found that have been successful there? You know, Slack, email, the usual suspects or PM system, uh, just out of curiosity. Figma has been a big help. I was remembering we used to design in Sketch before Figma, and then we had to put all those designs into Envision because that's where we can Oof. capture uh, feedback from clients. Uh -huh. So we get all the feedback in Envision. And then we work, of course, we do a lot of um, site development on our own. We also work with development partners and we'd have to put all that then in Zeppelin. Um, so not only the cost of all those tools, but just the overhead of moving files in and out of these different uh, softwares is so um, taxing on the team. And um, so Figma has a bit, Figma has been a big unlock for us. Um, and honestly, 
you know, it goes back to why we, you know, partly why we started this agency is, um, you know, me coming from the client side is every client's different as far as what they want, as far as what they want out of a partner, what their expectations are, what their culture is. I think my experience at Yeti was, and, and coming from GoPro and Crocs before that was agencies come in and tell you the things that they do and how they do them and why you'll benefit from them. And I'm sitting there at the other side of the table, like, you don't even know us. Like, you think you know every brand. And there's a lot of similarities across brands, but every brand is different in where they're at in their, in their, in their growth or change, what their team structure looks like, what their needs are, what their merchandising team, distribution team looks like, customers. It's all different. And um, when you think about today, even the way we work with clients or the way that we communicate with clients, it's tailored to them. Sometimes, I mean, Mike and I text with, with clients, Michael and I Ooh. get on the, I mean, you have to, like yeah. we get on the phone. I drove up, you know, drove up to LA last week, had breakfast with a client and, and lunch with a partner. You, there's no, like, this is the tool and this is how you do it. You've got to go, you've got to adapt to what your clients need and um, tailor that experience, tailor that, whether it's communication, design, engagement, strategy has to be tailored. If you get too big to tailor or too, or if you just start to do a one size fits all for brands, especially for brands, like it's a losing strategy. It will, it will lead to failure. I think that's really well said, Taylor, to the, to the client's processes and needs, because that really goes a long way. And I really like the idea of you texting your clients. I mean, <laughs> nobody does that. And this is really interesting oh, to hear that. You oh, still man. <laughs> we, I would say more than, I would say a majority are texting either Mike or me or both. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm curious to hear about, like, you, you, you brought an inter interesting point of, about your experience working with agencies. But when you worked with Michael, something must have changed. Something must have been, you found different his approach or what, what did you find that made you feel that this is not a traditional agency approach? I think a couple things really stood out and Michael might not even realized at the time, you know, how much that stood out. But one was that he didn't come in acting like he knew more about Yeti than we knew. He actually came in saying, I don't really know Yeti. I'm on the West Coast. And you guys really have, you know, you guys are mostly in the South, Southeast, which was true at the time. And, you know, this I is never 10, heard of 10 years before. ago. <laughs> and so I had no idea um, what a Tundra was or anything. And that was, that was big. It was, it was fair that he came in and said that. And um, we had so many partners come in and say, oh, I've, I've, I've had Yeti for years and I've got this, I've got and sending pictures of their kids using the standing in the Tundra. It's like, why does this make you, you know, you think, you know, the brand. Um, and so that was refreshing. The other thing that really set Michael apart, we try to bring this in the agency is, is, um, you know, very humble, like not coming in with all these design concepts and saying, this is what your site should look like. This is what your site should do, but really coming in humble and just listening to what we've been through as a brand, where we're going. And we, we try to advocate that to the team today to say, hey, you can, you should go into brands and tell them that you don't know and that you rely on them for that knowledge because we do. We can't do any of the work that we do without the knowledge that comes from the brands. Like any agency that comes in with that attitude that, hey, we're agency people, so we're blessed. Like we're hol holier than thou, we're smarter <laughs> than you, we're more... And we're just going to come in, like, just kind of get out of the way, like give us access to your Google analytics and kind of otherwise like get out of the way and just let us create something great. It's that mindset just is, um, is really backwards to us. We, we talk with our partners often about, you know, we really need them to be successful as well. How do you it navigate needs... those conversations with clients? You know, I think it's, you know, sometimes clients are hesitant to kind of open up the curtain. Again, it's finding the right client to mix with the right agency. We all know that. But in those cases, you know, I'd be curious to hear from Michael and then you, both of you and JP, like, 
from the client side and the agency side, what questions are you asking? How do you be like, tell me about, tell me about the brand, help, help me. How do I help you educate me on who you are? How do you guys facilitate that? Before I mean, you right answer, away, we tell them, a comment, oh, right. Okay. Just, just comment because it, it, it is, I just want to re-emphasize on the fact, the process and the methodology and the mindset that you described, because it requires courage to mm -hmm. go in and tell the client that I don't know. You want to hire us, but we don't. We are not the expert. In a way, you are an expert. They are hiring an expert team, but when an expert says that I don't know, is it requires courage. I mean, because you may just lose a deal at that point. Like you know, if you are, if you don't go in as, um, as a confident as you should be. Um, so so to I think. That back goes back to the Jesse's questions, like how do you navigate those conversations would be really helpful. Of course, we do our research, but I think, you know, to refine that, yeah. we say we don't know your business as well as you do. We understand best practices, we understand brand, we understand visual brand language, interactivity, et cetera. But you guys know your business better than anybody else. And so we need that knowledge to make the best experience because we'll bring forward amazing interactive, amazing UI, UX, digital design, but we need to lean on you guys to tell us your expectations, your business, your numbers, et cetera. Yeah, and you know, honestly, Varun, it's become, I think it's become very, you know, it's hard to say at first, but it's a, it's a, it's a built practice. And honestly, most of our clients, most of the brands respond with, with um, that, um, that it's refreshing because they're so tired of folks coming in and telling them what to do, how to do it, the tool they're missing, the technology, the integration, and being basically belittled by people that think they're smarter than them. And so the, the reception we've gotten is, this is refreshing. This is the type of relationship that we want. They can see our work. They know the first class UX and UI branded commerce design experiences we come, you know, we bring to bear. They can see that. Um, but the important thing is how did that come? How did those um, experiences come to fruition? It comes to fruition through working together. And that's why the soccer thing is such a good pull through because you can be a great soccer player, but if you're not going to play 11 people, if you're not going to work together as a team, what's it matter? Like you're going to lose games. And it's the same thing. Like we have the mentality that there's no one person that makes or breaks a project or a great partnership. We have to work. We really truly believe you have to work together. It's a good tie into the next question I'm going to ask you. So <laughs> we've had a lot of, you know, we've talked to quite a few agencies. Some have worked really well with co-founders. Some have had challenges and said, mm, this isn't for us. How do you guys make it work? No, uh, you know, like, we just keep texting each other all day long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big text calls. Let me be more yeah. specific, you know, as you both are specialists in various areas within the organization, but how is there, I mean, obviously there's a mutual respect. How do Definitely. you, how do you overcome sometimes when there is friction, I guess is, you know, that's the question that people are looking to figure out how to answer. It's easy when things are working. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. Let's do that. Awesome. We'll go. But you know, whether it's headbutting or however you want to describe that, how do you guys kind of navigate that? What's some, and you can't I mean, say we never have friction. <laughs> no, there's, we, we have, have friction every day. Every day, yeah. like it's, embrace, embrace it. It's trust yeah. too, trust and communication. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we disagree probably multiple times a day and, you know, it's really around one, you know, we both trust each other. Um, We've, we've gotten this far and to, you know, talking about it, being open and transparent with what we have issues with. And, you know, we usually find the conclusion very easily um, and we just move forward. You know, part of the time too, wherever the business falls or the, or the problem lies is, you know, we rely on each other in terms of our expertise. And so if it's more on the business side, I'll let, you know, JP makes the call. If it's on the creative side, JP allows me to have that call. 
And even though we may not agree, we have to trust each other. So yeah, boundaries. the trust, the communication. Yeah, and um, and that open communication, that open dialogue of you can't uh, you can't move conflict aside. You have to embrace that conflict. That goes for how we work with our brands too. I think there's a lot of agencies that want to put rose-colored glasses on their clients' eyes every time they come into a, a meeting or a QBR or something and show them just everything's going well. Like we're just having successes here and there. Look at all this great things we're doing. Come on guys. Like it branded e-commerce doesn't work like that. It's messy. It's very difficult. So is running an agency. So just embrace it, you know, just embrace it, work through some days, you know, some days you win, some days you lose, but um, you keep working together to do better the next day. And that's, you got to embrace that mentality. Um, I want to, take the conversation more towards how like you talked about uh, talked a few times about the type of clients you work with very focused like brands that you want to work on how how do you identify a right fit for you who is the right fit customer for you and what do you do um, to um, target them to like your client acquisition strategies, let's say, put it that way. Like how, what is that? How do you approach it? You know, just talk us about you know, the entire process around it. I, ideal for us are those, those brands that want to have the best in class um, brand experience for their customer. You know, they're focused on what's the digital experience for my, for my customer and then going out and finding a team that can help support them in that journey. They may not know everything about what that looks like, um, but they're looking for a client. They're looking for a partner that can help them um, explore that and and figure that out. Um, so we're looking for those you know those brands that want that have a story to tell, which is pretty much all brands. But are looking to you know thinking about their customer first, their customer experience, and they maybe they've seen something out there that they really like. Maybe they have a sense of where their brand wants to go. Um, and, and sometimes not, sometimes they really know the, the other side, you know, the other side of the business, they really understand their products or they really understand their operations. They really understand distribution, whatever it is, they're experts and they're looking for someone to, to, to partner with, to bring that, their brand experience to life, um, in a digital nature. That's, I, you know, that's the type of, um, you know, that's the type of client we look to work with. We often say like we're aspiring to be the best at what we do, and we look for brands that are aspiring to be the best at you know the the products and services that they that they offer as well. So that's that's the perfect match. Have you ever had to fire a client? Uh, <laughs> you don't have to tell us the story. Yes. It's always awkward. I just love asking. No. <laughs> well, yes, and here's the thing, you know our team comes, you know, clients can plug their ears for, for, for 10 seconds, but yeah, our earmuffs. team comes first. Our, <laughs> yeah. Earmuffs. Uh, our team comes first. Um, the reason why our clients love working with us is because our team is incredibly gifted and talented. Um, if we didn't have those folks, our team, like then, um, you know, the clients, the clients wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't be, wouldn't be happy or satisfied. So, you know, they, they come first and we've had instances where clients were beyond difficult. We, we love bring on a difficult client. We love it, but mm -hmm. beyond diff because, because, you know, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult industry and world. Right. But uh, abusive, or, mm -hmm. um, or rude, uh, you know, beyond, beyond like a moment, mm -hmm. you know, consistent, consistently disrespectful, a lack of remorse, um, ill natured. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, ha we have, we have had those conversations with clients and then we have moved, moved on from clients to let, you know, and to let our team know that they do come first. And that's, that's unacceptable. I mean, that's a, that's a personal and professional um, red line, like to treat people, to treat part, especially partners with disrespect. Absolutely not. It gets tough. People lose their cool. Like there's, there's launches and there's 
um, you know, all sorts of like moments in business deadlines. that can be tough, but wow. deadline, I mean, there's a hundred things, right. But, and people can lose their cool. That's understandable, but, uh, respect and, and, um, being, being good natured as a partner is, is important to us. We have had very difficult clients where our team has said, we want to quit. And we said, no, difficult isn't why we quit. Uh, it, you know, that's a, that's a different story. Let's work. If there's difficulties, let's work through. And we have, um, we have some amazing stories there of clients that were really on the far side of difficult. And now we've had glowing successes with because of our change in approach. Um, do you have but, some nuggets for that? You know, that would be, I'd love to hear. <laughs> well, cause it's one of the challenges. My favorite story is many, many years ago in an agency I worked at. Um, I can't name names, but we had a client who asked us to move a graphic 21 times, literally pixels. Like, can you move it two pixels up 21 times? I thought my designer was going to walk out. So, you know, how do you navigate those? You bribe them with coffee and donuts. Um, you know, and just gave her an easy client the next time around. Like, what are some of the stories that you guys, like, how have you, I guess, you know, in the spirit of the podcast and the conversation with you, how do you manage kind of your team and support them in some of those difficult challenges that, you know, what are some nuggets that you have to kind of get them over some of those humps? I'll Definitely it's situational. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, it differs for each situation. But again, going back to, because we're remote, Communication is key, having conversations with them, providing support where they need it, whether it's extra support, buying more time with the client, um, you know, limiting the amount of pages that are due, you know, working with the creative team first or the design team first to, to alleviate any type of stress. And then going to the client, having a conversation with them, talking about what's going on in their end, um, if they're stressed out, Right. What's why are they acting this way or why are you putting pressure on the team this way and just trying to figure it out from there? You know, I, I think one of the clients that JP is talking about, you know, we went through this whole first round of work. We did it and we're like, wow, that was that was tough. That was a tough relationship. And we thought they thought the same. Well, they came back a couple months later going, we loved you guys. <laughs> Can we work with you guys again? And then we had to communicate with them, hey, that first time around, it was very difficult for us. So in order for us to work together again, we need to fix X, Y, Z moving forward. And now it's a great relationship. So it really comes down to having that line of communication with the client and being completely transparent with them. Because yeah, actually just as add, an extension to the team, being a partner. I'll just add like, usually it's, usually it's a change in approach. Um, usually we, you know, sometimes we're a hammer, everything's a nail. And so usually it's a change in approach. Like, how are we doing the work? How are we, how are we engaging with the client? Let's try switching it up. And as Mike said, some, there's usually some pressure coming onto the client that's being transferred to us. And so us getting closer and being more empathetic and understanding what is going on over there. We're not in the four walls. We don't live and breathe the brand every day like they do. And if you've worked brand side, if you're listening and you work brand side, you're probably working right now. You're probably going to work this weekend. You're probably working tonight. Brand side is like drinking from the fire hose. Agency is a bit different because you're, you're doing a lot of switching. And so building that understanding and that empathy of like, what is actually going on in those four walls today? They come into a 1 p.m. meeting. They've probably been in meetings since 8 a.m. Do they even know what meeting is at 1 p.m.? And so understanding that, under being empathetic, understanding what they live through, and then aligning to what's what's causing that concern, what's causing that frustration and let's solve for that. Let's make sure we're a great partner there first or else we're not going to be able to get past that without solving for that, whatever they're going through. You talked about the, uh, your gifted team or talented people. What, what is, what have you done in terms of making sure the team is um, smart and stay smart and up to date with things that you know, they're supposed to do right from hiring all the way to making sure they are um, 
you know, up to date with the latest trends? Are there any processes around that that you guys follow? Oh gosh, yeah. there's so many. Yeah. <laughs> Give us, you, you know, you know, three to five. <laughs> well, well, finding finding creative talent for you for e-commerce design is is somewhat of a a needle in the haystack. So you have to have an understanding of UX and UI, and some lean more on one than the other. And so, being open to that type of talent when it presents itself or when it comes in and creating a space for that type of talent on the team. Not everyone, like just like clients, not every creative talent's the same. And so understanding, having that flexibility and the space uh, to bring on and create a space for these creatives to, to flourish and practice what they're good at in regards to staying on top of, of trends or best practices. I mean, we have a UX focus and a UI focus. Um, we have a UX team uh, with with directors in the Master of Library Sciences. And so they're bringing a lot of education and research to the table. We have um, painters and artists on the team that are bringing like a fine arts background. Um, we have illustrators on the team that are photographers. And so creating, creating a space for these individuals to share and to communicate, whether it be a Slack or coffee and donut meetups, right? Or, you know, uh, JP and I get to get, get the team together once a year and we go on a company retreat. This last year we went to LA, Culver City, uh, rented out the Culver Hotel, went, spent a couple of days going checking out museums, had a, had a team dinner. And so allowing these guys to get together and, 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 physically get together and have a good time, get away from the work, uh, you know, bring the cultures together. And we also allow them to, you know, if we ever get into a project or a situation to allow them to go uh, to destinations to get together for their practices, uh, like a design day. We had a design day, you know, last year in Seattle, uh, planning the UX team to get together, you know, somewhere for a UX retreat. So, you know, there, there are many different ways that that happens. And I think, you know, it's just having the ability to um, be open and, and ask for that, for that type of uh, collaboration and camaraderie to, to take place. On the, on the hiring side, just to add, you know, we spend, of course, we spend a lot of time looking at people's books, their background, um, looking to see that they understand the science, obviously in the UX side, the science, um and the methodology the tools like there's so the table stakes just to um you know to do branded commerce design is is pretty high we look for all of that but ultimately we're looking for people that are have different backgrounds that come from different places because we don't do one type of work for one type of client we do a wide range of work for in every industry across a lot of different clients different sizes so we need that we need those different backgrounds, different perspectives. We're not trying to have an LA design group or a New York or a Seattle design group. We're trying to have a design group that can um, understand global global brands and that can bring the best solution from you know all corners of the talent pool. Um, and so we look for that that variety and background, but ultimately we're looking for um, a shared passion for doing the best work because. They can have all of the table. We've we've hired and lost folks that had every every toolkit to every every tool in the toolkit to be successful, but they didn't have that genesis qua of like that special passion of like I'm just not going to put it down till it's better. Like I'm going to take it that extra round that like fighting spirit, um, that passion for their craft. Um, that's that's a big part of who we are as you know that that's a big part of who we are as an agency is that like everyone on the team wants to create the the best you know and, and has a hard time stopping before they do how did you come up with the name elva <laughs> that was uh that was me i uh when i was at my previous agency i i started elva as uh as a you know just a, a side business 
as I was getting to work with with agency as, as I was planning on leaving. And uh, I, I named it after the two first initials of my children. So my, my daughter's name is L and my son's name is Vance. And so at the time, the, the transition for me to, to leave the agency I was working for and to start Elba was to really do it for my children and my family. And so I didn't plan on it to be an agency of 25 people. I always knew I'd partner up with 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 someone like JP. Actually, I knew it was going to be JP from day one. Uh, but uh, yeah, I didn't realize that we would take it this far. And when when JP and I formalized our, our partnership, I asked him if he wanted to continue with the name. And he said, yeah, it's got a nice ring to it. So it's cool. here we are. And and nice. and you've got bigger problems than changing your name <laughs> as a, as a new agency. So it's like, hey, true, it's good. Let's keep it going. True. No, it's unique. I was curious. So, yeah, last question you. for both of you: what's um, what's exciting you about the future? You know, JP, why don't you go first, and we'll close out with Michael. I think the half-life of knowledge in, in like branded e-commerce is about what a year, maybe a year and a half. It might even be shorter these days. Um, as far as like what, you know, how fast things are, how rapidly things are changing. Um, you think about the last couple of years with what COVID did to digital, not only the way we work, but who we work with and, um, how people shop online um, and expectations of brands and how they um, deploy digital has, has changed rapidly. I don't think the rate of um, growth or change is going to slow. I think it's going to accelerate when you think about AI and all the uh, different implications of how people will work. Um, and so what's exciting is that I don't think the challenges are going away. I think they're getting more, uh, I think they're getting even more like tough to grasp. And um, for someone like Michael and myself, uh, the, the, um, the thought of things changing and getting more difficult is exciting because that means that we're gonna have um, many more exciting adventures with these brands going forward. So there's gonna be tough problems to solve and that doesn't, um, that doesn't frighten us away. That actually is kind of like the siren song for us and brings us brings us closer to to the industry nice i know that's kind of a sick uh, mentality but <laughs> that's how we are i mean i'll piggyback off that you know in regards to what excites me i think what excites me is not only the the technology improving and implementing that into you know our output in the near future ai of course Brands are starting to understand their their customers and their customer needs um, a lot. There's a deeper connection there. And so these customers are not only coming to their sites to sell products and to buy them, they're coming to engage in a culture connection, engage with the actual culture that, that the brand portrays. And these brands have a story to tell. These products have a story to tell. And customers are now coming directly to the brands to get that story. And so that's where things, I think, where JP talks about part of these things, they start to get complicated because sometimes these stories are not easy to tell. And when you integrate these stories with products or you integrate these stories with the brand and you get into contextual commerce, content commerce, storytelling, how does that take place in a UI UX perspective? Each brand is different. So that story is going to be different. That interactivity is going to be different. And so that excites me that these, the content and the stories for these brands are becoming richer and more robust mm -hmm. and customers are relying on, are going direct to the store the source for that, for that connection. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. This was a great conversation and some, some good insights here. So for folks looking connect with both JP and Michael, you can find them on LinkedIn or helloelvaelva.com. So that's it, everyone. If you learned something today or laughed, please tell somebody about the podcast. Thanks and see you next Thank you time. so much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. 
Thanks for listening. Find our other episodes on agencies.build.com. Plus, we're listed anywhere you find your favorite podcast.